Hello. First tonight, the funeral of the first British soldier to die in Afghanistan this year. Private Robert Hayes was just 19 years old when he was killed during a foot patrol in Helmand province. He'd been in Afghanistan with the 1st Battalion, the Royal Anglian Regiment, for two and a half months. At his funeral today at Burwell in Cambridgeshire, he was described as a man with physical, moral and cold courage. If respect could be measured in a silence, then Private Hayes today commanded huge respect from the near 500 people, both outside and within St Mary's Church. In life I loved you dearly, in death I love you still. In my heart you hold a place no one else will ever feel. If tears would build a stairway and heartache make a lane, I'll walk the path to heaven and bring you back again. Robert, or Robbie Hayes, became a full-time soldier just seven months before he went to war in October. The 19-year-old was killed by a Taliban bomb on January the 3rd. Today, he was described as a man who possessed physical, moral, and above all, raw courage. It uh, displayed those on countless occasions, really, uh, in engagements with the enemy in Afghanistan, but also the, the moral courage of, of being the guy at the front of his section, leading them into areas where he knew and they knew IEDs of what awaited them, you know, and that takes a, a, a very real degree, degree of courage. At his primary in his home village of Burwell, he was seen as a team player. He was one of a group of children who were very energetic, Lovely children to teach, willing to learn. He was part of that group. He was a really popular boy. And the reaction, of course, when Robbie Hayes was the second Anglian to die in Afghanistan since October, the 15th soldier from the East to be killed here in the last 12 months. If soldiering was Robbie's first passion, then rugby was certainly his second. You'd often find him down here at Newmarket Rugby Club. In a tribute, they said that he had a unique talent for helping out the club's veterans. He last played here in December, just days before he headed back out to Afghanistan. A good turnout today. Immaculate turnout today. I was proud to turn up for him. To represent him as our Burl hero, I can't talk really. I'm thinking of his father. And to father. show our support, for, obviously, for the servicemen and women serving in Afghanistan, etc. So I think everybody needs to do their part and show their respect. As the coffin was borne out, the sun broke through and light snow fell on the mourners. From his mother, Diane, a final testament. From childhood, she wrote on the order of service, Robbie had one ambition, to be a soldier. He fulfilled his dream. Alex Dunlop, BBC Look East, Burwell. There's been a dramatic development in the case of a man standing trial for murder. For three weeks, Stephen Marshall has denied killing Geoffrey Howe, but has admitted cutting up the body and leaving parts at a number of locations across Hertfordshire and Leicestershire. Today, he changed his plea to guilty of murder. His girlfriend, Sarah Bush, still denies the charges. Mike Cartwright is in St Albans now. Yes, Stuart, an extraordinary twist in this trial today. We've heard two weeks of evidence. Stephen Marshall, we've got a, a photograph of him here. He stood in the dock today. Again, the charge of murder was read out. Again, he was asked to give a plea. This time, though, his answer was not guilty, my lad. He, he spoke really without emotion, just looking straight ahead in the court, as he's done for much of this trial, really showing no emotion while the evidence has been heard. I've seen him shake his head a couple of times as he's disagreed with some of the things that have been said. Never have I, though, seen him look across at his co-defendant co and girlfriend, Sarah Bush, age 21. Then, just a formality, really, for the jury, their verdict, guilty, of course, and now the case will continue without him. So have we got any idea exactly what happened or why he did it? Well, Geoffrey Howe was stabbed to death, we think, in his flat in London. Why? An elaborate plot, we've been told, to take his home, his possessions and his money. Now, we've got a picture of Geoffrey Howe to show you. He was uh, 49, he was a kitchen salesman. He, he disappeared in March and then in the weeks afterwards, body parts then started appearing across the Hertfordshire countryside. It was a, a gruesome investigation, if you like, for, for Hertfordshire police. Uh, a left leg was found in Cotterid, uh, forearm near St Albans. His torso was found in his own suitcase and a head was found in... Leicestershire. Now, what's been really chilling about this evidence is uh, the evidence given by the uh, forensic anthropologist. Now, she said the dissection showed a huge amount of skill. It was accomplished. And uh, 
uh, an evidence given by one of Mr. Marshall's friends said he'd boasted about doing this type of thing before. Now, Sarah Bush, will, she'll be back in the dock on Monday. We've got an artist impression of her. She's charged with murder and also chopping up the body and, and, just, and uh, scattering the parts. Now, the uh, case should go on for another week, but there's a strong suggestion this could all finish on Monday. Mike, thank you very much indeed. The inquest into the death of a man from Cambridgeshire who was injected with a fatal dose of diamorphine by a locum doctor from Germany has been told Dr. Daniel Ubani had profound ignorance of painkilling drugs. The doctor was working for the out-of-hours service Take Care Now. His patient, David Gray, died at his home in Maney two years ago. On his second day giving evidence, Dr. James Kennedy, executive medical director of Take Care Now, said Daniel Lubani presented himself as very plausible and professional. But it was clear his lack of knowledge of opiate drugs was profound. He said it had hit him very starkly. Dr. Lubani had gone through every step of a checklist before administering the fatal dose. He had broken open two seals on the palliative care box, seen warning notices about the powerful controlled drugs within, completed documentation correctly before giving 100 milligrams of diamorphine to David Gray. It seemed the doctor hadn't understood the difference between diamorphine and pethidine. Dr Christopher Azokwi, an experienced GP, carried out the induction of Dr Ubani at the Riverside Clinic in Ipswich. It was the first doctor's induction report he'd carried out for TCN. Dr Azokwi said the induction lasted little more than one and a half hours. In his view, it should have been longer. At the time, he was on call, giving second opinions to nurse practitioners. Later, he was called out on an urgent visit. He wasn't in a position to properly assess Dr Ubani's competence. The coroner asked him, have you had any formal training to act as an inductor? He answered, none whatsoever. Dr Azokwi was the last witness to be called. On Monday, the legal teams representing the Gray family, Cambridgeshire Primary Care Trust and TCN will make their final submissions to the coroner. He's due to deliver his verdict next Thursday. Kim Riley, BBC Look East, Wisbeach. Well, still to come.